um, and tuning into this afternoon's session titled Exercise Testing for Community-Based Adaptive Sports and Recreation Program as part of the Move United Leadership Conference. My name is Ryan Semke. I'm the Insurance Program Manager here at Move United, formerly Disabled Sports USA. We'd like to thank the Bob Woodruff Foundation for their long-standing commitment and support, allowing us to bring you this virtual opportunity. For those who missed any previous sessions, all recordings and session resources, including PowerPoints, can be found on the conference webpage. This is the same webpage you use to RSVP for this session. This presentation, along with the PowerPoint, will be available on that site uh, starting tomorrow as well. Before turning the show over to our speaker this afternoon, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. All attendees will be on mute to minimize distractions. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions rather than in the chat. Feel free to use the chat feature to introduce yourselves and interact with other attendees, but please set your chat settings to include all panelists and attendees so you're communicating with the entire group. And without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our presenter this afternoon. My name is Ashley Falaise and I am with Blaze Sports America and I will be bringing you your afternoon session today, exercise testing for community-based adaptive sports and recreation programming. I'm gonna give you just a quick brief intro into who I am and what I do and what I know. And then we'll go into our learning objectives and we'll get on with our session. So I am the training and education manager with Blaze Sports America. So basically what I do is I run all of our uh, training and education initiatives, including the CAR certifications, the Certified Adaptive Recreation and Sports Specialist Credential. Um, I oversee our institute, the Blaze Sports Institute for Adaptive Sports and Recreation, our webinar series, as well as our training tools um, that can be found on our website. Um, before coming to Blaze, I am, well, before coming to Blaze and currently, I'm currently finishing up my PhD at the University of Georgia with my emphasis area in motor behavior and my dissertation topic on exercise testing for individuals with intellectual disabilities. I also have my master's from the University of Georgia in motor behavior and my undergraduate uh, bachelor's in exercise science from Georgia State University. So exercise testing is certainly something that's been in my wheelhouse for a long time. I've um, had a lot of experience testing clinically different adaptive uh, sport populations, but more recently, probably in the past six years, community-based adaptive sports programming. So we'll go ahead and get going. So just our learning outcomes, especially for those of you that are looking to um, get CAR CEUs from this session or NCTRC CEs for this session. So by the end of the session, um, we will be able to do three things. But actually, before we get to those three things, I have two quick survey questions for you real fast if you guys will help me out. First one is, what are you most looking to get out of this webinar? So your answers, real, your choices real fast here, are how to exercise test, exercise testing that's disability specific, or community-based exercise testing best practices. So I'll give you guys a second. If you guys can respond to my first poll, then Ryan in a second, we'll go ahead and do that second poll and then we'll bounce back to learning objectives. All right, in my second poll, um, you're either answering yes or no to this question. I currently do exercise testing in my community-based program, so that's a yes or a no for the second poll. And this will kind of give me an idea of who's participating and what you guys are looking to get out of the session.
Perfect. All right, so about one quarter of you do community-based exercise testing and the other three quarters of you guys do not. So that's good to know. Hopefully I can give you guys some best practices and we can change that to 100% or at least a 75-25 split in the future. I think we should be able to see the other poll in a second. There we go. Uh, Community-based testing best practices. Perfect, okay. So we'll go into a little bit of disability specific and then really community-based testing best practices. So the learning outcomes from this session. Um, by the end of the session, each participant will be able to critically examine why programs should exercise test adaptive sports and recreation athletes, select the best test battery for adaptive sports slash recreation programming for both individuals and teams, understand how to proctor exercise testing for individuals with physical, visual, and intellectual impairments in adaptive sports and recreation programming. So if you tuned in to the session before mine, um, Maddie really went into the clinical aspect of adaptive sports testing and what I've kind of learned from my background is that's all well and good. There's definitely things that we can take from that as best practices, but as community-based providers, a lot of that, unless you can link up with a university, is really hard for us to do. But on the same token, um, funders are constantly looking for ways for us to evaluate our programs um, and show them what's working, what's not working, so they can continue to fund us, right? Because we're community-based. So we need to find simpler, easier solutions with that don't take a degree in exercise science to perform, to evaluate our athletes and teams and um, look at strengths and weaknesses and how to improve in the future. So. The importance of exercise testing for community-based programs. So I really kind of move this in to three categories. So you have your responsibility to funders. So funders want to know how your programs are doing. Are they actually improving uh, physical fitness of individuals? Are they improving increased socialization? Are they improving BMI? What are your programs doing outside of sports? So yes, we see that you're ranked number one in this area or you have this many people in your program, but what else are you doing for those individuals? So exercise testing is a great way to kind of show to your funders what your programs are doing from a physiological standpoint for your athletes. Second tier of this would be to inform athletes. So you're actually letting your athletes know, well, you know, maybe you didn't get 10 free throws in wheelchair basketball throughout the season. Or, you know, our, our sitting volleyball team is ranked 5 out of 25 nationally. But you're able to say, this is what physiologically our adaptive sports and rec programming is doing for you that's going to help you overall in your day-to-day -day life. So one term that I might mention throughout this presentation is called an ADL activity of daily living. So ultimately, adaptive sports and recreation is a multifaceted approach to improve lifelong health and wellness. But a lot of things that are included in that would be improving activities of daily living. So activity of daily living, uh, being able to reach up on a high shelf and grab something without falling over, being able to transfer from your chair into the car and have enough flexibility to reach behind you and buckle your seatbelt. All activities that are living that are important for everyday life. So we wanna be able to inform our athletes how they are physiologically improving. Are they getting stronger? Are they getting more flexible? Are they having an increased cardiovascular load that they're being able to handle? So being able to report back to your athlete season after season or even in season, pre-testing and post-testing. So at the beginning of the season, at the end of the season, this is how you improved. It's a great thing to do, especially for youth athletes, to track them as they move throughout your program, um, to kind of show well, when you came in, this was kind of what you were able to do um, in your chair, out of your chair, just moving around cardiovascularly. This was your flexibility level. You've been with us for five years, and not only have you increased your socialization, um, learned competitive, games and recreational activities, learn how to be physically active on your own, but you've also improved physiologically. And then the third thing that exercise testing can do for your community-based program is to kind of internally evaluate your program. So it could be something that your athletes and maybe funders never see, but for instance, um, 
I'll, I'll mention our wheelchair basketball program a lot at Blaze because that's the program that we most um, critically exercise test right now to kind of see what we're doing, what we can improve. So we do pre and post testing for wheelchair basketball right now. And basically that helps us look season to season. So in our off season, we can look back at our pre and post tests and what our numbers are telling us and see what we need to improve. Yeah, we improved our rankings. Um, yes, we've had more kids get into um, post-secondary to do adaptive sports, but are we improving our cardiovascular health? Are we improving our flexibility? Are we ultimately improving um, our activities of daily living? And if not, what can we do to strengthen that for the next season? So we talked about activities of daily living. When you look at fitness components in general, they're really broken up into two categories. You've got health-related components of fitness, which include cardiovascular, muscular strength, muscular endurance, flexibility, and body composition. And then you've got skill-related components of fitness, so agility, balance, power, reaction time, coordination, and speed. So cardiovascular um, health is basically how, how optimal your heart is working to move oxygen through your body. Muscular strength is really the mass amount of strength one muscle or group of muscles can produce over a period of time. Muscular endurance is um, how long can a muscle withstand a certain amount of activity. So we often think of like a push-up test or a curl-up test for that. Flexibility is how much um, motion a joint has or a group of joints have. Um, and then body composition First thing everybody thinks of when you think of body composition is you immediately go to BMI. Well, we know BMI is not the most accurate um, for determining body composition anymore, and it's certainly not the most accurate for adaptive athletes, so we'll talk about that a little later. And then as far as skill-related, you've got agility, which is kind of our ability to move quickly and easily, uh, balance, which is our way to evenly distribute our body weight so that we are able to remain upright in different positions, Power, so that's basically the max force you're able to produce in a short period of time. Reaction time is really simply the time it takes from you to see something happen for your body to actually react. Uh, coordination is your ability to move different parts of the body in an organized fashion to complete a skill. And then speed is simply the rate at which someone is able to move. So when we talk about community-based exercise testing, there's really two things that I think about. There's individual exercise testing, and then there's team testing. So really, I want to look at kind of the pros and cons of both and why you might choose to do one over the other, and then just general best practices for testing. So under best practices for testing, there's the clinical model that says everything has to be similar. You want to repeat this exactly as A, B, C, D down the line. There's no different. Well, we know for community-based um, programs, that's really not as practical. So we have best practices for testing in a community-based setting as well. So as far as individual exercise testing, um, some of the pros of doing individual exercise testing, so one-on-one -on -one between a tester and an athlete, um, is that they have one-on-one -on -one attention, first of all. So they have somebody that is looking at how they're physically doing the activity, and before they actually do the test, can look at how they're moving and maybe give them pointers or um, quick tips to do the actual test more appropriately or better for them. So you've got that one one someone right there looking at your athlete. It's also the same tester. So um, we'll talk about tester difference in a little bit, but having the same person test all your athletes, um, it, there's no bias one way or another. Um, you've got the order of activities. So generally, when you do, when you pick an exercise testing protocol or you piecemeal one together, which is what more community-based programs are going to do, um, you will pick an order of activities and you'll repeat that order the same way each time. So that if you do the cardiovascular test first and then you follow it by muscular strength and then you follow it by muscular endurance, the muscles are fatiguing at the exact same rate for each person. So you're not doing all the muscular tests first for one person and then the cardio test, but doing the cardiovascular test first for another person. So you're able to do the same order of activities. Um, you're able to give additional 
response, which prompts, which I've already talked about as well. So those are all pros to individual exercise testing one-on-one. -on -one. Some cons. So commands or prompts can be different. So for instance, if you have somebody creating or proctoring a cardiovascular test, and we come up with some general, hey, you're doing a great job, it's one minute mark, keep going. You wanna kinda of have the same prompts because we all know what motivates our athletes and we know what we can do to get the best out of them. So sometimes um, approaching it from a different prompt so that, hey, you got this, whereas we know some athletes, we just need to give them the like one minute, three minute, all in, where some people need a little more talking to you throughout their session. So the commands and prompts could be different. So without knowing it, you could motivate someone differently than another athlete that would help them perform higher. So that's a con for one-on-one -on -one testing. Um, also, if you have an individual, you're giving the instructions for each test battery individually every single time. So if you're doing it with a large group, you can give the test battery directions to 12 people, say, at one time, and then everybody can perform the test at the same time if you have enough testers right there. So that's definitely a con of one-on-one. -on -one. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Nope, perfect. Okay. So team testing. So team testing um, can be a great thing to do if you're shorter on time, but you have more individuals to help you test. So if you only have one person or two people that really feel comfortable with exercise testing, individual or small group testing is going to be something that works better for your community-based program. Whereas if you can get um, some students from a university, volunteers, even parents to help you proctor testing, you can kind of give them the directions and then all do them at once and they can score. Team testing can be a much quicker option and everybody gets kind of the same flow and same direction. So real quickly, your pros and cons is it can move quickly as a pro um, and the flow of testing just kind of keeps going. So everybody knows they do this activity and then they bop to this. So you can almost kind of do a circuit um, where they start at different sections, do the test and then rotate. So you can do it quite quickly. Um, but some of the cons, if you did the circuit way, one thing that you'd need to note is that the order of activities would be off. So somebody would be doing the cardiovascular test before they did the muscular test. Somebody would do flexibility before they did the cardio test. So they might be fatiguing in different ways. For community-based, I really don't see too much of a problem with that because ultimately we're not in a clinical setting. Um, we're just trying to exercise test our individuals to get um, as accurate results as we can and kind of get an idea of their physiological um, um, other cons, so you need more people to test, um, and you can actually have people record differently. So what somebody sees as doing uh, 41 curl ups, somebody else might be like, ah, that last one didn't count, that's only 40. So you've got kind of a tester difference. So that's kind of a testing team aspect, pros and cons, and then best practices for testing. So if you are going to exercise tests to try to get the most accurate results you can in a community-based setting, here's my six corners for you. Try to use the same order of activities if you can. Try to keep the same environment. So don't do your exercise testing indoor one day for one group of athletes and then do the same test battery outdoor when it's 80 degrees the next day for another group of athletes. So try to keep on the same field, the same terrain, um, basically the same environment if you can. Um, also in season, so there's going to be some differences to exercise testing outside in 60 degree weather to exercise testing outside in 85 degree weather, so just be aware of that. Try to use the same equipment. So you'll need to, which we'll talk about in a second, decide what makes the most sense for your program. Do you want them to use, if they use wheelchairs for mobility, use their everyday chair for exercise testing? use their sport chair that hopefully is just their sport chair for the season? Um, do you want them to use their everyday prosthetic or their sport prosthetic? Um, that is a decision that you need to make as a program and then stick with it and just be consistent through testing. Um, keep it the same place in your schedule. So you don't want to exercise test your team uh, at the very first practice 
the first year and at the very last practice the second year or the towards the end of the first year and then the second year say well we don't have time the first three weeks so we're going to start week four well it's not going to be really a true pre compared to last season so you want to try to exercise test at the same time you want to try to keep the same testers so it can be parents um, it can be students from a university or it can be just relying on your internal staff to do testing but the more consistency you have in testers from either pre to post or season to season, the better. And you wanna to try to use the same prompts when you're testing. So having the same set of, okay, at the one minute mark, we're gonna say this, at the three minute mark, we're gonna say this, or when we're looking at flexibility, this is the kind of generic prompt we're gonna give for stretching so everybody is motivated the same way. So that's kind of the best practices for a community-based setting. So disability specific concerns, which is what a lot of you are here for, and then I'm actually gonna go into, let me check my time, good, um, the different test batteries, and I'll specifically point out which test batteries are great for different populations as well. So for disability specific concerns, there's gonna be techniques that we talk about first for physical impairments, and then we'll talk about techniques for visual impairments and techniques for intellectual impairments. I'm gonna go through all three of those major groups because I know that some programs only serve one of those areas and some kind of serve people kind of on the full inclusion scale. So I'll just briefly mention all of it and give a full overview. So basically you hopefully have an understanding when you go to exercise test, what best practices is across the gauntlet. Um, so just some techniques for exercise testing, specifically for our wheelchair users. So you can think of people that use chairs for mobility in two different ways. You can think of those as the athletes that use a chair daily in day-to-day -day life, and then also our athletes that play in a chair. So uh, for example, different sports, uh, individuals that may be ambulatory or have an amp amputation, depending on disability, actually play seated, um, seated volleyball, or in their chair. So um, for wheelchair users, you need to consider the terrain that you're testing on, especially if you're in sport chairs, um, whether you're going to have them do their test battery in their sport chair or their everyday chair. Um, so really what comes into play for using their everyday chair versus sport chair to me is that if you have uh, young athletes, so youth that are not used to moving in a sport chair yet, or you have vets that uh, are newly injured and are still getting used to their everyday chair, it might be, if you have a large group of them, uh, more appropriate to test in their everyday chair versus their sport chair, um, as they're just getting used to physically moving their chair. Uh, you need to understand, before you exercise test um, individuals that use a wheelchair for mobility, what their mobility is, what their level um, of injury is, so that you understand what flexibility testing might look like for them, um, if they have any specificity, um, that's going to not affect the accuracy because you're going to record what you see from the individual doing the test to the best of their abilities, but it's gonna impact the safety of the athletes. So understanding um, if they tell you, you know, when I lean forward, I have, a, I have a complete spinal cord injury at this level. You need to know kind of when they lean forward, are they gonna be able to pull themselves back without using their hands? Um, that's kind of a safety thing because a lot of these test batteries will be in chairs, but a lot of them will actually have them transfer out of a chair if they are able into um, either a folding chair or just a regular chair, but a lot of times it doesn't have arms. Um, because of the nature of the test battery. So understanding their support needs is important. Um, heart rate difference. So um, because an individual is um, using a chair for mobility and they're in a seated position, they are going to have different heart rates than normal. So if you're trying to compare um, heart rate levels, if you're looking for um, oxygen testing, basically to kind of see what their oxygen rate of consumption is, which is what you'd be looking for for cardiovascular, um, heart rate differences can be found with wheelchair users as well. Still record it, still do the test battery the same. Um, make sure that everybody knows that 
they have a right to stop a test at any time. Um, they don't have to give it their all out, especially if they feel unsafe, if they feel woozy, if they feel dizzy, um, they can stop the test at any time, which is not really true, as true in a clinical setting, because the clinical setting will push you just a little harder to get right to where that true stop is. As a, as a community-based program, we need to stop well before that. Um, so safety, understanding um, when we're exercise testing, the strapping that we may use in a chair is not as appropriate in exercise testing unless it's a safety concern. So understanding what strapping they use on their chair and what the strapping is needed for. And then it's something as simple as just recording on your sheet, use their strapping at their waist or use their strapping around their feet um, or did not. And then that way, you know, when they just re repeat the test later in the season that they repeat it the same way with that same strapping. And then a big thing for all our athletes, but especially those for use uh, chair for mobility, is asking them to empty their bowel bladder before testing. It's just a general best practice um, for everybody, but especially for our chair users. So next for our amputees or anybody that has limb loss, um, the kind of techniques that you would think about here is you want to use unilateral, so just one side, testing when applicable. Um, so, for instance, for the flexibility testing, you might only get a flexibility rate on one side. Um, if they can't maintain a squat and they're prosthetic, you might need to change the test battery a little for them or pick another test battery um, to replace that. So, understanding when you just want to use one side of body testing or if you want to test both sides and just record that prosthetic, um, your sport prosthetic or everyday prosthetic was used on the other side. Um, so absolutely can test, exercise tests with great confidence. Um, individuals with limb loss or limb difference, they might not completely compare to norms in some area though. I will give you a, for instance, say you had a below the elbow uh, upper arm limb loss and you're going to do the back scratch test. So basically it's a flexibility test where you're taking one hand, you're reaching behind your back, over your shoulder, behind your back, and your other hand is coming up your back and trying to basically make contact between your fingertips right at kind of the level of your shoulder blades. And then you're measuring the difference, either the touching, the overlap, or the distance between fingertips, and that's what you're recording. So obviously if somebody has a below the elbow amputation, you're gonna need to record the number that's the difference when they're doing the back scratch test, but you won't be able to prepare, compare that to a norm for age per se, because they're missing about, you know, at least seven inches of what normally would be a hand there. So still record it, still record improvement, but you might not have norms to compare to. Um, and then you've got just your general concerns when you're exercising period. So looking at um, stump breakdown and rubbing, during exercise testing. So sometimes we're asking them to move in a different way or sustain a position that they don't normally sustain. So just making them hyper aware of that. And then um, there's the big question of to test or not to test with the prosthetic. So some of these exercise test batteries can be done without their prosthetic. Um, and it kind of becomes a, do we want them to have the prosthetic or actually is it easier them, for them to move without the prosthetic? So that is a test to test kind of concern. Really, that's up to you what you want to do um, as far as moving forward. If you want to say, hey, we're just not going to use the upper arm prosthetic for this exercise test battery until we get to um, anything that might need it. For example, cardiovascularly, we're just not going to use it because um, it actually would increase drag. And then you've got individuals that are short stature. So um, some concerns here would be flexibility, range of um, motion in joints. Um, exercise test battery should be very similar to what an able body or even an adoptive athlete is doing. Just know that norms and standards will not be appropriate to compare to. So really they're comparing to themselves and trying to better their own score. Um, distances also might need to be cut in half as well. So then if we jump to impairments, our techniques for visual impairments, you've got 
really a couple things. You definitely need um, individuals to help alongside as you're exercise testing. So you're gonna need more physical prompts and more verbal prompts. So making sure that the individual fully understands the testing battery that you're gonna be putting them through, what the expectation is, um, how their body needs to move during the exercise test and having an individual to help them. Um, best practices for cardio, for instance, um, I would use a step test, which I'll talk about in a little bit, instead of running with a guide, because generally that person is trying to keep up with the guide or the guide is pacing them. So you might not get the best cardiovascular reads um, for someone with a visual impairment. Um, you can use visual or verbal prompting. So it could be a recorded of like the, hey, once you get to this level, this is what we're gonna have you do. So it's a consistent script between VIs. Um, and then you can also, if you give additional prompting, physical prompting, like if you're having to help them kind of see where that touch point is um, for a certain body movement, you would just record that in your recording. And lastly, for individuals with intellectual impairments, um, best practices for exercise testing are to demonstrate the activity. So first, when you're thinking of the test battery for someone with an intellectual disability, you wanna keep it short and simple. Um, this is not, in theory, the time to shoot for the moon and try to do 12 test batteries at one time um, in one season. Maybe pick three or four things that you best want to keep up with throughout the season and stick to those. Um, teach the test kind of part, part, whole. So you give one part of the test, try it, the second part of the test, try it, and then do the whole test. Um, we already talked about smaller batteries. And then the, um, for all youth, basically across this gauntlet that we just talked about, um, ID, visual impairments, and physical impairments, um, there is a test battery that was specifically put in place to be used in a PE setting called the Brockport Fitness Test. Um, it can be proctored pretty easily with very minimal equipment um, to a larger group of youth with disabilities that um, you can use as a resource. And at the end of this presentation, I have a bunch of links and um, the PowerPoint will be sent out to you guys as well if you'd like it. Um, and they're directly linked to extra resources that you can pull uh, test batteries from, including the Brockport. Okay, so we're gonna go into our disability specific test batteries um, that I believe are most appropriate for community-based programs. So for cardiovascular health, there's five tests on here. Um, a six minute push test, a multi-stage field test for wheelchair users, the pacer test, a two minute step test, um, I'll talk about a three minute step test as well, and a six minute walk test. So I'm gonna give you, let me check my time, I'm gonna give you the short and simple on each of these, but know that all of these can be found in the resource section. So really quickly, the six minute push test for wheelchair users basically has them pushing um, around a 15 meter setup. So 15 meters down, there's a cone, 15 meters back. So it's 30 meters total over six minutes. You ask them to keep a comfortable pace and you count their laps. You say you take a heart rate before, simple heart rate, you can actually use just a heart rate monitor um, or teach them how to manually record their heart rate. You take one before, a heart rate before for pretty much all of the cardiovascular tests and then you're going to take a heart rate as soon as they finish exercise so that you see the difference between their resting and peak heart rate. That's what you're going to need if you're going to try to um, impute their oxygen saturation while exercise testing. Um, at the basic level, you can just put, show the difference that, you know, their heart rate was resting here and was a peak here. Ideally, as they get stronger and stronger, that you either want to see an increase in how far they were able to go or a decrease in their heart rate and going the same distance if they're improving. So the six-minute push test is great for wheelchair users. There's a multi-stage field test for wheelchair users, um, which basically is kind of set up like an octagon with 15 meter straight, so the top, the bottom, and the two sides are 15 minute meter straights. And then instead of asking the individual to take a hard right turn um, around a corner, it's a little, it's sloped a little bit like an octagon, so it's more of a um, slight turn as opposed to a hard turn. Um, test battery basically 
gives them an amount of time to get down the 15 meter straightway and make it to the turn before a certain beep. So you would download the beep program really on your phone. It's really easy. Um, and basically it's tiered where they have, if they keep a certain speed, so it starts at, there's one minute stages and it's basically going to increase um, the speed at which they should make it to the next line every single time. And you're basically recording the last straightaway that they could successfully make before they heard the next beep. Um, this can actually be done, the, the six minute push test and the multi-stage field test can be done with multiple people at the same time as long as you have people recording. Um, pacer test, the pacer is great for individuals that are short stature for amputees, um, also can be good for our ID population. Um, basically, this is what a lot of us possibly did in elementary, middle, or high school. It is a series of beeps that they have to run between. So basically for the pacer test, um, you're doing a 20 meter shuttle. So you have 20 meters to move your body across from one side to the other. Um, the speed starts at 8.5 kilometers per hour and increases throughout the test. So they have, uh, they have to make it from one line to the other and they have to cross the line in order for that lap to count while the speed is escalating between the beeps. And then the last, um, whatever, if they can't make it to two lines in a row, then they need to, then they're discontinue the test and you record that number. So then there's a two minute step test, which is great for visual impairments. Basically all you need for this is a 12 inch high box. Um, you're setting a cadence um, on your phone. So you can use a metronome of either 96 beats per minute or 64 beats per minute. And they basically have two minutes uh, to continue on that cadence. So up, up, down, down to the 96 or 64 beat per minute cadence of stepping up with left foot up with right foot, down with right foot, down with left foot um, during that time. So you get a heart rate before and a heart rate after. There's also a um, three minute step test. That's just a little different. Um, I'm sorry, that was the three minute step test. The two minute step test, which is good for visual. Um, nope, I messed them up. The three minute step test is good for visual impairments because it's just on a step so you can tactically show them where that step is, up, up, down, down. The three minute step test, nope, the two minute step test, sorry, um, is great for individuals with lower mobility, possibly an aging population. Basically what you're doing there is you're taking a measurement at the middle between their knee and their hip and you are marking in the middle of that on their leg and you're putting a piece of tape on the wall in front of them at that level. And for uh, two minutes, they need to march in place with their knee coming up at least to that line for two minutes. Um, and you're marking how many successful steps they have and then they also, that they come up to uh, the height of the line and then also what their heart rate is before and after. And then for individuals with more severe mobility impairments, you've got a six minute walk test where basically um, you're walking 50 yards back and forth for six minutes at their preferred speed. And you're just marking how many laps they complete and where they finish heart rate before and after. I'm cutting it short, so I'm gonna keep going. All right, uh, so some tests for muscular strength that are easy to do for community-based providers. Uh, is a seated med ball throw, which is great for everyone. Um, a hand grip strength test, a seated push-up test, and a one rep max test. So what you're looking at here for a seated med ball throw is an individual is either sitting in their chair or they're sitting on the ground, wall behind them, legs stretched out front, and then without leaning forward, they are taking a med ball uh, normally about an eight pound ball, but you can also do a smaller pound ball. And they are exerting maximum force, hinging their arms in and basically chest passing it as far as they can. And you're recording the farthest distance that that ball hits. So not rolling to, but hits the ground. Um, so that's pretty easy. Most of us can probably source a med ball. Um, it, we've actually were able to get seven. So we were able to do this test quite quickly. 
a hand grip strength test is something that's great, especially um, for our athletes that need uh, more dexterity in their sport. Think of bocha, think of swimming, uh, think of any of our wheelchair athletes that need to have good hand strength to propel that wheelchair forward. Um, the easiest thing to do for this is to get a hand grip diameter. Don't worry about getting the old school ones that are metal and you have to do a um, hard read on where the little lever moves to. The easiest thing to do is to go online, I think they're about 20 bucks, and grab a digital one. Basically, they're squeezing this contraption um, for about three seconds as hard as they can, and it will record the highest um, level of strength that they're able to perform, and you can write that down. It's great for also showing uh, hand difference in strength. Uh, you've got a seated push-up test, so um, this is good for upper extremity muscular strength testing. So basically, what they're doing is from a either chair, like sitting in a normal chair or sitting in their everyday chair, they are placing their hands um, on the armrest of the chair and are pushing their arms till their arms are fully extended, straight up and down. Um, in most cases, their bottom will have cleared from the seat. In some cases, they're not. That's fine, as long as they are pushing up with arms fully extended um, and you are recording how long they're able to do that for. So for youth, you're going up to, 60, up to 20 seconds, and for adults, you're going up to 60 seconds. And then if you have someone that's comfortable, um, one rep max testing is a good idea for muscular strength. You can basically do this with a bench press. Um, you could do this with an arm curl. There's lots of different ways you could do this with somebody um, who kind of understands how to one rep max test. One rep max testing is not um, a test I would recommend if you don't have somebody comfortable leading the activity. But basically the premise behind this is that um, you are trying to find what is the maximum amount of weight somebody can move safely in a given activity one time. So you start with, and you want to get it in within five tries. So you start with one around what you think they're able to move, and then you can bump the weight up a little and a little, and then you can move it down as they're not able to do it. So you want to find the weight that they're able to move in five tries, though. Otherwise, it's becoming more of a muscular endurance test. So for muscular endurance, you've got a curl-up test, a push-up test, an arm curl test, a 30-second chair stand test, and a wall squat. So a curl-up test is good for abdominal endurance. Um, you need good trunk control to do this. Basically, you're laying down, and um, the individual is asked to curl up, basically lean forward without using their hands. Their hands are sliding on the mat to a certain marker. It's about 4.5 inches away, so you can just literally use a piece of tape to mark where their arms are extended by their side and then mark 4.5 inches and their fingertips have to slide over to that second piece of tape. Um, there's a cadence that they can keep to with the same kind of pacer CD, um, CD or you can get the cadence online and then as they do as many as they can keeping up with the cadence of up and down and you record the max amount. Uh, there's a push-up test, so basically this is in 60 seconds. You can either do um, knees down push-up or a traditional push-up. This is good for upper body endurance for individuals that have good trunk control. It's normally recorded as the most in 60 seconds for a push-up test. You've got an arm curl test, which is great for upper body endurance. It can be done by just about everyone. Um, you can vary the weight that's used between four, five, or eight pound dumbbells. In the hand, basically you need a chair without an arm on it because they're going to need to let their arm be completely extended and then pull it back up to their shoulder and put it back down. So this is great for um, individuals with lower mobility as well. You've got a 30 second chair stand test. So basically for lower body endurance, you have two different test batteries that are pretty easy to proctor that you can use. One that's better that for people that have decreased mobility, and then one that's better for our um, more ambulatory, stronger athletes. So the 30-second chair stand test basically asks you 
to put your arms across your chest and stand up and sit back down into the chair without using your arms as many times as you can, keeping good mobility in 30 seconds. Wall squat test basically has you step about two feet away from the wall, squat down so that your back is in contact with the wall and your hips and knees are at both 90 degrees and hold that position um, for as long as you can without losing form would be your wall squat test. All right, we're getting down to it. So our test batteries for flexibility. Um, this is really important, I think, in community-based programs to be able to show um, increased flexibility because that's a huge activity of daily living that helps us kind of throughout our life. Um, easiest thing to do is a back scratch test. So kind of already talked about this. Here's a picture of this up here. So basically, it's a good test of up flexibility. You're taking one arm, you're reaching over the shoulder, taking your other arm, reaching behind your back, and you're trying to have those fingers come in contact or as close to contact as possible. Generally, using um, middle digits is a good place to test from, and you're either testing or you're recording the distance between that they're touching or that the hands are actually overlapping and how much the fingers are overlapping. Uh, then there's a sit and reach, but a lot of us probably did something very similar in high school. There's a sit and reach box where basically the person is sitting on the floor, legs extended out in front of them, and we're ultimately looking for with reaching hand over hand and leaning forward, how far their hands come, either before their feet, on top of their feet, or past their feet as far as flexibility. It requires a box, but you can also make one. You can also just get um, a piece of wood, a couple two by fours, and then have a tape measure starting after that, and you can mark it that way. And then you've got the chair sit and reach. So basically this is going to be, it's called sometimes called the back saver sit and reach. Um, well, it's a chair sit and reach, and then you can do the back saver sit and reach. So there's a sit and reach test where you do both feet together, and then the back saver sit and reach where you actually only do left foot and you hinge right foot up so it's kind of out of the way. And then you also test right foot, so you put right foot out and left foot up. And then you've got a chair sit and reach where basically what you do is you sit completely upright with your back against the back of the chair, or sorry, towards the front of the chair. So you're sitting kind of on the edge of the chair. So you need to make sure that you have good trunk stability and flexibility to do those tests. Um, you're hinging one foot at 90 degrees, the other foot is extended, and then you're reaching out to hand over hand to have your fingertips with your head looking straight, reach as close to your toes as possible and you're recording that measure. So real fast for body composition, um, we know that BMI is not the best indicator for able-bodied individuals um, for overall body composition, and that's the same for adaptive athletes. So I would caution you, unless you really just need an easy measure to just record BMI. Um, if you were gonna record BMI, you would need to know the height and the weight of your athletes. Um, and you can also calculate that for sex specifically. What I would much more recommend is something like this picture here, which is called a BIA machine, um, bioelectrical impedance analysis machine. It's basically um, sending a small current from one hand all the way through the body to the other hand, and it gives you a little more accurate read on um, percent body fat. Um, they can be picked up really easy off Amazon. They're a good kind of thing to have around. You can set it um, so that it clears or that it saves for multiple users as well. So I didn't want to finish up without kind of talking about some things that you can do for skill-related components of fitness. So the big, the big five, Cardiovascular, muscular endurance, muscular strength, flexibility, and body composition are big, but there also needs to be some thought behind the skill-related components of fitness. So balance, agility, coordination are all good things to test, and they don't have to be hard test batteries. It's really, what are you looking to gain from your program for these individuals, and then deciding what you're gonna test. So for instance, for an older population, um, an eight foot timed up and go would be great. So basically they're standing up from a chair without using their arms. They're walking eight feet up around a cone and back in a timed manner. Um, you've got a measure speed test or sprint test for power. 
you can set up a very easy cone weave test to measure agility. So they've got to go in and out um, of a certain number of cones, space a certain distance apart, and you can kind of tailor this to your program. Uh, and you're recording the amount of time that needs to do it. You can be specific on your turn. So they're coming in, out, in, out, and then a right turn and coming back again. Uh, you can do a standing balance test. That's pretty easy to kind of proctor. How long can they stand with eyes closed? How long can they stand with eyes open? Can they stand on one foot? And then uh, easy thing for coordination is an alternate hand wall toss test. So you're basically taking a ball like a tennis ball or a larger ball. You're throwing it to the wall and trying to catch it with your other hand. So how many times they can do that successfully in a minute or 30 seconds is an easy test for coordination. So sport specific um, considerations. You don't necessarily mean to just pick exercise tests that meet the big five. Because um, there's other things we need to know that might be better for the internal um, knowledge of our programs. So you've got your necessary basic skills per group. So for instance, for our wheelchair basketball team, we are interested in um, how many free throws were they able to make in a given amount of time? How many dribbles could they get with one hand? They could pick their hand, dominant hand, in 60 seconds. Um, so you can pick small, necessary, basic skills to test for that sport and keep testing it. Um, I really, really, really push you to use what you have around you. So if you have access to a track, if you have access to a pool, use that. You don't really need to jump out of the box and get 20 different pieces of testing equipment to do this correctly. A lot of it can be done with a phone, um, which can double as a timer, a recording device, um, and very, very small pieces of equipment or some kind of DIY things. So use what you have around you. Uh, equipment specific testing. So think about, um, for instance, if you wanted to do a time test for cardiovascular of your wheelchair track program using their race chairs. So think about what the equipment is that they're gonna be in their programs with and think about if that's the best for testing. And then the other thing you can do, um, especially since we're not clinical from that standpoint looking at it, is look at what able-bodied measures are done for sports specific testing. And is it a way we can adapt those to our athletes and use those metrics? So real fast, I told you I would give you um, a snapshot of some of the resources that I talked about. So you've got the developmental and adaptive physical activity assessment text. So this is great um, with different sections on how you would assess physical activity. You've got the senior fitness testing manual. So if you have an older population, they basically have a set fitness battery um, for limited mobility. That's great in that manual. Um, they give you the sheets to record. Basically, you buy the book and you are set to go on that. Uh, NICPAD also has a great resource, uh, wheelchair fitness testing, top end sports. Um, basically, if you go into top end sports on this link and say fitness testing and I want to look at cardiovascular test or type in a test and search it, it will give you the what you need to do it, why you do it, here's how you do it, test protocol, and here's how you write up the results. You've got the Brockport's Fitness Test Manual link in here as well, and then the Eurofit Special. So the Eurofit was a test battery that was created in Europe to assess physical fitness, and about 10 years ago, they came up with the Eurofit Special, which was intended for a more adaptive population. So there's different test batteries there in there as well that you can kind of pick and choose what you might like to use. Perfect. So we're gonna move to q and I put at the very front of the webinar chat before everybody got on, I listed my contact information. So any questions that we don't get to during this time, you're more than welcome to email me, um, especially for technical assistance with exercise test batteries, happy to help, happy to give you uh, best practices as well, or kind of talk you through what might, you might want to do. There's my contact information there. I would email me right now because Blaze is still not back in the office yet. We are all working remotely. And I am going to see if I can pull up Q&A. Ryan, what you got? 
Yeah, so thanks, Ashley. Um, thank you, everyone who's attended so far and has thrown out some questions. We have a couple more minutes to answer a lot of your questions. Um, so uh, we've had a lot of really good questions here. Some of them you've addressed a little bit. Um, but one thing that's come up is obviously we're all in the adapt the nonprofit world, a lot of us. Um, and what are some good ways of keeping the cost low for these tests? Um, and then the resources that you just shared, are there typically fees associated with using that information or obtaining it, or is it uh, mostly just the equipment? So as far as the, the test battery, um, some of them, if you're looking for official results, um, if you're gonna enter it into their system to pull official results of rankings, you might need to pay a fee. But for a lot of these tests um, that I went through for a community-based setting, you can just record your numbers right as is and really do with minimal stuff. A stopwatch, which can be your phone. Um, we use painter's tape a lot for marking distances. So a good roll of painter's tape, um, depending on what you wanna do for um, flexibility testing, a tape measure. I mean, we, we pretty much can do a full gauntlet battery of testing for our wheelchair athletes in wheelchair basketball with a tape measure, a roll of painter's tape, uh, a med ball, a stopwatch, and a recording device. Now we do teach our athletes how to um, manually assess their heart rate. That's a little challenging. Um, so if individuals had heart rate monitors or you had one for your program, that would be great as well uh, for lower cost. What else did you have for me, Ryan? I think I awesome. answered half that question. Uh, that, that was mostly it. Um, and then kind of on the same avenue as um, fees for the testing, do, does Blaze or do you know of programs that are charging athletes or their program participants to utilize the testing services you're offering or is it included in program fees? No, ours are, ours are actually required. So we require that our athletes, um, because, because our programs are grant funded at Blaze, in order for us to go back to our funders and report and evaluate our program, we have to be able to exercise test our athletes as one of our measures. So we, I guess, pro provide the services for free um, because we need them for our own metrics. Um, and kind of along the same lines there, um, for programs that are mostly outdoor recreation based um, <laughs> that might have a limited program schedule, have you seen a lot of value um, for those, those funders and those organizations to do this type of program testing? Um, and if so, what's kind of the threshold of a participation schedule where this would be useful whereas, or versus just a waste of time? Yeah, I think, I think for these to be useful, you really need to have athletes that are participating consistently in programming. So for instance, if you were doing kayaking and you guys were meeting once a week, um, and, and going down river, this might not be the best use of time for your program. Whereas if you have a wheelchair basketball program um, and you're meeting twice a week and you're seeing these guys for five or six months, um, it's a lot more important to kind of gauge the physiological health increases as opposed to you know, a climbing program that meets for six weeks. Um, I would think personally that time would might be better spent um, actually physically doing the activity and then doing more of a social, um, emotional, and then their own behavioral kind of change before and after as far as evaluation. Right, and I guess this, that's a good example of something that could be done for a smaller week or two week program um, over, that's kind of all inclusive over the summer, maybe lowering those standards of, not, maybe not standards, but lowering the, um, the in-depth of the testing to kind of track progress during that training camp almost. Yeah, so when we, when we do our testing at Blaze, for example, we try to take as minimal time away from coaching as possible. Um, it, it, when we do our teams right now, it's team, it tends to take about 30 to 45 minutes, which is a lot out of a practice, but because it is an important metric in our program, we do it. Um, for some of our smaller programs that, um, really need a lot more or meet less or need a lot more one-on-one -on -one coaching we try to tailor that down to more to 15 20 minutes um, or break it up over two days awesome 
Um, one question, kind of a little specific, um, talking about wheelchair users, while you're doing the tests, if you're doing tests and some are in everyday chairs and some are in sport chairs, do you want to have mixed results or do you want everyone in the same type of chair? Um, ideally, in a perfect world, in a clinical world, you want everybody in the same type of chair, but we're, in a, we're not in a clinical-based setting. So in a community-based setting, ideally we want them in the same chair, but as long as you're reporting internally on your own paper of what, they, what chair they were in, that's fine. We know that different that sport chairs versus everyday chairs move differently. So some one chair might have an advantage in a test over another, but as long as you're recording it, that's fine. Awesome, thanks. And then um, along the same lines a little bit, can you give a couple, maybe one or two or three um, kind of key evaluation tests that smaller organizations who are looking into doing this testing for the first time might want to address to start building their testing program? Yeah, so I would pick a cardiovascular test, I would pick a muscular endurance test, and I would pick a flexibility test. Wham, bam. Um, just a quick cardio, how much can you move, or what distance can you move in a given time, and what was your heart rate before and after? A quick uh, pick a endurance test, so how many push-ups, how many curl-ups, um, how many arm curls with the weight can you do in a given time and pick a flexibility test? What's your upper body flexibility um, or what's your trunk flexibility? And that should give you a, just a quick, here's three tests, kind of an outline of what you're doing physiologically as far as your program is for improving health and wellness. Awesome, thank you. Um, we are running up on time here. Maybe we have time for one or two more, but we're not gonna be able to get to everyone's questions. Um, that being said, we will, be following up with everyone who's reached out with questions. Um, so you will get a response from Ashley uh, in the coming days uh, if you've posed a question that we haven't been able to address here. Um, but we're getting a couple more specific ones. One of them being, um, are there tests that would assess dynamic balance? Um, would the standing balance test uh, be something that's good for that? Yeah, so I think it depends on um, what type of athletes you're testing that would be more appropriate. I'm happy if um, whoever sent that over, uh, this will be directed to me via email, but I'm happy to expand on that and give you different dynamic stability tests that would be appropriate and easy to proctor. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of folks who have asked you to demonstrate a couple of the tests. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll let them uh, either follow up or hopefully um, they'll be included, I'm sure, in some of the resources you provided. Yeah, so that's the downside of a virtual session um, and trying to get all the information to you. I think when we originally looked at doing this, we were going to be in the gym. Um, and this would have been a longer session where we would have done this real quick and then we would have gotten the gym. And instead of me kind of explaining them, we were actually going to do them together as a group. It's so a little hard to demonstrate. To a little hard to demonstrate a sit and reach while you're uh, sitting at your desk. Yes, yes. So I'm happy to for anyone that really needs it. Um, send I guess videos out too of what it looks like um, as part of technical assistance as well. Awesome. All right. Well, again, I think that that about does us for time. We don't want to keep anyone for much longer. Um, so thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Please feel free to sign up for as many sessions this week as you want. We'll be going until Friday. Um, again, thank you for joining us at the Move United Leadership Conference. Ashley, thank you very much for a wonderful session. Um, very informative. Uh, as you'll see, we had a lot of questions. Um, so hopefully everyone stays well, and we'll see everyone tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you, guys.